welcome back to the exciting show of the called the Five Spot. I'm your host Donovan McNabb, joined with Armando Segaro, and we are going to give you some explosive information of what's going on with teams, why teams look as bad as they do, some of the rules that uh, are going on in the league, which is kind of rubbing some players the wrong way. But let's dive right into the game last night uh, with the New Orleans Saints and the Jacksonville Jaguars. I picked the Jacksonville Jaguars to be kind of the sleeper team this year after what I seen last year under Doug Peterson. Uh, Trevor Lawrence, I expected him to have one of those comeback seasons or most improved seasons from last year uh, by bringing in Ridley as a wide receiver to add on to Evan Ingram and Christian Kirk uh, and ETN in the backfield. Started out a little bit up and down in the beginning of the season, but playing against the New Orleans Saints, I thought this would be a game that will boost them into uh, the direction that I expected them to finally end up in. Uh, but a win is a win. But what I've seen from this Jacksonville Jaguars team is uh, they didn't throw the ball a lot. Uh, 20 or 29 from Trevor Lawrence for only 204 yards. Uh, I expected ETN to have one of those days where, you know, maybe 105 uh, rushing yards. He only had 59 uh, rushing yards, but only on eight carries. Uh, and then, or excuse me, 14 carries of 53 yards. Uh, Trevor Lawrence had eight carries for 59 yards. But it was more to me when I look at this Jacksonville Jaguars team uh, because the game was close. It, I, it was more of this defense. And the New Orleans Saints, to me, I tried to attack this defense by throwing the football. And I thought this defense did enough to keep themselves in the game and, and was hoping for the offense to carry the load and finish at the end. Things worked out in their favor, obviously, with uh, a drop pass in the end zone. But Christian Kirk and Trevor Lawrence did what they had to do at the end of the game to seal uh, the victory at the end. Armando, I know this game was slow, and I'm, I'm pretty sure you had your, your popcorn popping and uh, maybe some wings going to kind of lead you to help you stay up for this game. What did you see? Uh, in this game last night? Yeah, Donovan, I cannot confirm that <laughs> there was popcorn or wings, but there might have been burgers, <laughs> plural. Uh, so I, and there might have been cheese on Jeez. the burgers, so <laughs> plural. Um, and the might have been patties <laughs> on the burgers, plural. Just, but moving on to the game and not All my right. my gastronomic abilities. Um, <laughs> uh, two things, man. Uh, first of all, last week tre or this week actually, Trevor Lawrence wasn't walking. He could not walk. He had right. to sprain me. And obviously, you don't practice during you know a Thursday night week. You right. The healthy players don't practice. They walk through. Trevor Lawrence didn't practice, uh, did walk through. And then the game comes on, and he's running like crazy. And I'm thinking, <laughs> holy moly. And I see this big honking brace on his oh, knee. Oh, got the knee brace, yeah. Under his sock. And the dude is, uh, you know, he's like, he he's sunshine out of, you know, <laughs> Love the movie. Yes. Love the right? movie. Yes. Uh, I mean, I was expecting him to karate chop somebody on the way down the field. <laughs> so that was impressive to me that he, yeah. you know, he bowed up and said, no, thank you, injury. I'm going to perform today. Right. And then the other thing that I, I took away from the game is you don't want Derek Carr. You really don't want any quarterback throwing 55 times. No, no. Right. right. If, if, how many times did you throw over 50 times and win? I mean, that's that's got to be hard. So it's a recipe for disaster, so to speak, unless unless you're on fire. So if you're throwing 50 times and you end up 35, 38 for 50 for four, 423 uh, and you win by 21, that that's a little bit different. That's a little bit different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, I will say this, and, and I don't want to be the second-guess media loser, but 
Um, Foster Moreau, he drops a pass that was catchable that might have, you know, tied the game. Right. Jimmy Graham, who is six foot six, uh, and has the reach between here and Nevada, uh, <laughs> because he's a basketball player at the right. University of Miami. Da, 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 da. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he makes that play. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm just saying. I'm not so, second guessing. So but Armando, I guess in I'm... your eyes, speaking of Jimmy Graham, do you think that he's kind of faded? His game is kind of faded enough where now they're trying to go with the youth movement to have have uh, the other tight end there, or or do you think that you know they're just trying to spread the ball around and the Jimmy Graham numbers just wasn't called? Oh, no, Jimmy Graham is 36 years old. He's he's a late signing. He's, he hadn't played in, you know, a year or maybe even two. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, right? I, so yeah, think, he, yeah, that's tough. It, it, it's not 2015 by any right. means. Um, but in that particular moment, and I, I'm not second-guessing them. I'm not saying Jimmy Graham should have been in the game. But he is an imposing target in the red zone. Right. Right. That cannot but, be taken away from him at 36 years old. But let's let's stay with the New Orleans Saints. I mean, for Derek Carr to throw the ball 55 times for, for 301 yards, you targeted Alvin Kamara 14 times. And, yeah, give or take, you targeted also Aleve, who uh, I think is a talented receiver out of Ohio State. Uh, to me, I see him a little bit more as a slot receiver. Uh, and not sliding him by any means because he's, he's super talented. He can play outside. But to put him inside and outside, I think it's something they should really look at. Um, but more importantly, you targeted your running back 15 times. What does that say about the wide receiving core for the New Orleans Saints? All right. So I get the the targeting Kamara because he's good. Yeah, he's very good. <laughs> right? He's very had good. a 1,000-yard receiving season once upon a time. So – I get it, but it it also speaks to as you just mentioned the the receivers, the outside receivers. It speaks to their ability. If the New Orleans Saints had a one A and a one B outside, I don't think Kamara would be getting fifteen passes. No, the fact of the matter is Thomas is coming off of multiple years of ankle problems he's he's healthy now but is he the same guy that he was two and a half years ago no uh, uh, right yeah right yeah and, and alave is is okay he's good uh he's a first round pick i get it he's yeah fine right but is he an alpha is he a wr1 not yet no yeah, not, not yet. yet so that's why you 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 go with your guy and sometimes also they had offensive line problems there was a lot of dumping down and and you know check down going on last night because they had to so i guess that all together combines to create 15 targets for the running back well from the quarterback position you obviously have to read over the defense and not force anything um you know Derek carr only with one interception uh, in the game. So that check down that you're talking about, that's when you utilize your tight ends and your running backs because they are playing soft coverage and you're just taking advantage of the opportunity. So I get I get a little bit of the 15 targets, maybe eight, seven, or eight. But when you go 15, that means you're just trying to almost force feed them a bit, um, even with coverage. Uh, and so I just think for the New Orleans Saints, and I'll say more of the NFC South at this particular point with, Atlanta and, and New Orleans and Carolina, uh, Tampa. It's not a, a division that's one of the top divisions uh, in, in the NFL, and it hasn't been strong, I would say, over the last couple of years. But who would you say is the class uh, of that division? Because we, we would think the New Orleans Saints, because obviously Tom left Tampa, Baker Mayfield comes in, uh, Carolina has Bryce Young, first first pick of the draft. That's going to be a rebuilding year. Uh, Atlanta, people are sold on Ritter, even though that I think he just lost his first home game. Uh, and Atlanta has some actually has some weapons on offense. 
Um, and, and so do you think it's more Tampa or should we kind of keep our eyes on Atlanta uh, to, to kind of carry the weight and in, in, in this thing in the division? This is what I think of the NFC South. One of those teams is going to make the playoffs. One, one of those teams. One. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then that team will be out of the playoffs. Uh, the first playoff round, whoever, because, I mean, seriously, <laughs> I, you're trying to build them up and respect them. Ah, nah. <laughs> Sorry. You're, you're, you got flawed teams. And yeah. Flawed teams may, may get to the playoffs. Right. And often do, but they don't hang around. True. Uh, and so, but it depends on how they're playing at the end, Armando. They could be hot at that time where they could become a problem in that first round uh, versus nah, whatever team they're playing. Nah, 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 <laughs> nah, nah, Not really working. Derek Carr, we know who, who he is. Fair? Right, right. Baker Mayfield, we know who he is. We pretty and much know who he is. Who both those guys are is some Sundays they're going to be good. Right. And some Sundays they're not going to be good. And I like both guys and both human beings and they're wonderful people and they're competitors. Urgh! I get it. But if I need a game one in the, you know, in the wild card or divisional round, I'm not picking either one of those guys. Well, I mean, that that's, that's a tough draw, but you know, you heard it from Armando. I didn't say it, but you heard it from Armando. <laughs> hey, you know what? In, in whatever it is, three months or whatever, when Tampa or right. New Orleans is in the NFC Championship game, yeah, you can you can take a an enormous dump on what I just said. <laughs> yeah, we we won't and be I'll, taking any dumps on what you said, but we'll we'll let that carry. We'll let that just flow in the wayside right now, and, and leave it at that. But let's move on to another game, and I, let me address the elephant in the room. Obviously with conversation being being said from uh you know from a few few guys in Philadelphia that may may light of uh something that I was asked about the issues that's going on with the Philadelphia offense and and basically what I said was things have changed uh by the the spat that was going on on the sideline between AJ Brown and Jalen Hurts and which led to Nick Sirianni being involved and a few other people um I don't take back what I said because I think playing this game, there are things that happen during the course of a season that either change for the better or change for the worse. Not saying that the conversation on the sideline changed for the worse, but you can you can see things have moved in a different direction from where they started. The way that this offense can become become successful in Philadelphia is by running the football first, utilizing the quick and intermediate passing game, and then taking your shots. I thought leading into in that Jets game, and not just the Jets game, but leading into it, so the games prior, I thought it was more of getting trying to get the ball, push the ball downfield more, uh, feature uh, a few of the guys instead of getting back to what got him there. DeAndre Swift is is proven that he can run in this offense and be very effective. Gainwell uh, can pick up some yards and with with twelve to fifteen carries or touches. Uh, Boston can add a little bit more in the run game. And I think with Jalen Hurts and his ability to run the football, uh, he will be able to add to the running game. And then you can go from there. But for my comments that I made, uh, and listen, I'm a grown man. If if you have any issues, you can reach out to me. We can talk about it. And I can tell you what I'm seeing because of my experience playing the game. I know and I've been there. Um, so we'll leave that at that. Um, and, and But – in order for this team to continue to be the team that we all expect them, then that's going back to the NFC Championship and possibly Super Bowl, is by being able to establish that run game first and then limit the throws uh, for Jalen between, I would say, between 25, 28 times. So that means you're running the football 35 times or, or so to balance things out. Armando, when they play the Dallas Cowboys, I mean, excuse me, when they play the, the Miami Dolphins in this regard, and I know you're going to chime in on, on just the comments that I, that I made and, and, and what's been transpiring, but give us toward the end, obviously, of what they need to do in order to get back on track. 
Yeah, so I, I appreciate your comments. They are very mature, very, as you said, grown man. I'm in seventh grade. <laughs> I'm not a grown man. So uh, uh, let, let me dive in here a second, if, if I might. So A.J. Brown, who is at the core and the epicenter of this whole thing, during the Minnesota game, which was week two for the Philadelphia Eagles, he was seen on national television getting into an argument with his quarterback and his coach, and it was heated, and it was not pleasant. It was not uh, uh, friendly. They were disagreeing, and A.J. Brown was clearly upset. And he is saying that it had nothing to do with uh, targets, right? I'm going to take the man at his at his word and suppose that it's not about targets. It was about something, and you were peeved. Um, and and it, it, it has had an effect on targets, and this is how I look at it. First game of the season. Devontae Smith, seven targets. A.J. Brown, seven targets. Second game against Minnesota. Devontae Smith, four targets. A.J. Brown, four targets. After the argument, the next week against the Bucks, Devontae Smith, four targets. A.J. Brown, nine. The next week, Devontae Smith, seven. A.J. Brown, nine. The next week, Devontae Smith, one. A.J. Brown, six. The next week, Devontae Smith, five. A.J. Brown, seven. The point is, whether the conversation was about targets or not, it has had an effect on targets because they have basically skewed towards A.J. Brown away from Devontae Smith since that argument and basically, you know, tilted the, the, the passing game towards one guy where before it was balanced. And that's not good for the Philadelphia Eagles. That's all I got to say about that. Well, I mean, listen, when, with this offense, like I mentioned, I think it should be more of establishing the run. Now, things change in, in, in each week, depending on who you're playing. Uh, but you still have to establish that run game. And when you establish the run game, now that forces teams to have to play zone coverage or – now they, they try to add another man in the box. And, yes, that's when you utilize that quick game and intermediate game. And so when you look at the numbers where Philadelphia is at this particular point, the, the group that usually kind of gets in that medium where it balances it out a little bit is the tight end position. Dallas got her at, at this position, and, and I think he can become an, an NFC representative uh, in the Pro Bowl with this offense. But they don't utilize him enough. They don't utilize him enough in, in the media, middle of the field, uh, possibly running corner routes or out routes or shallow crosses. And then, obviously, your checkdowns are important. Now, again, this is just their first loss versus the New York Jets. And people are kind of, like, throwing their hands up and almost panicking. I'm not. Now, I think this is all correctable. I think this is going up against the Miami Dolphins de defense that's really not as strong uh, as they could be, especially from what their offense looks like. So I think they'll be able to utilize and get back on track with running the football, utilizing their screen game. Uh, then on the outside, we start to spread the roll around and get it downfield. Um, obviously with Ramsey, I think Ramsey may be suiting up for this game. He may be back. Um, I've seen him at practice moving around. So I'm sure he's probably doubtful, um, but we'll see. Uh you know, and then the list goes on of what, what I've seen from this defense. But offensively, I think for the Philadelphia Eagles to get back on track, and then it's it's big on defense, just to mention, just a quick note, Jalen Carter and I think Slay will be back uh, for this game. They were out for the Jets game. So that's going to help with their pass rush and obviously with their coverage. But offensively, I think the Philadelphia Eagles have to get back to uh, that run game, the intermediate pass game, quick game, uh, and then take your shots. You get about five to six shots a game. Uh, and if we can connect on three of those, then I think that's big in them getting you back on track. Yeah, so this is a game of two five and one teams who are considered at the elite right. of what the NFL is right now. And it's true. You you are what your record says you are, right? right. That's that's what you are. Bill Parcells, my friend, said that. Um, so 
the Eagles are coming off a loss. Right. The Dolphins, they have five wins, right? Right. Um, they beat the Patriots. The Patriots are one and five. Yeah. They beat the Giants. The Giants are one and five. Right. They beat the Broncos. Stop the Broncos. They are one, one and five. five. They beat Carolina. 0 oh and six. 0 oh and six. They beat the Chargers two and three. They lost. And they one lost game. the Buffalo. Was, right, four and two. So, for the Miami Dolphins, all I'm saying, and this is going to make Miami Dolphins fans crazy, but for the Miami Dolphins, this is your "Are you for real?" game because you you just you know curb stomped a lot of teams that are really bad that you're I mean, supposed to beat. That you're right. supposed to be. They're really bad. Right. And now you and you lost to the team that is good. So this is another team that is good. Right. So what are you? Are you uh, a, a contender, in fact, where you can be last year's NFC champion at home? Or are you a pretender that loads up on one and five and 0 oh and six teams, but when you're facing a winning team, you kind of shrink back a little bit. This game will decide that. I would also say that Jalen Ramsey starting to practice this week is huge for them. Yeah. Uh, I've been told he is targeting the November 5th game against Kansas City as his comeback game. That so might be that's going to be huge. Yeah. They need him, and that's going to be great for their defense. I don't know if he, if Jalen Ramsey is going to be Jalen Ramsey this year. Right. But he's going to be present, and that's better than anything that they've had on the field before. Um, I, also, the Eagles, uh, yeah, you were the NFC champions last year. you got to do some work against that yeah. offense of the Miami Dolphins because they are, regardless of who they're playing, they're good. They're going to score. They're fast. They present problems. Right. Well, I mean – but let, let's let's really diagnose the defense of, uh, of the Philadelphia Eagles. I mean, they, they have one of the best uh, front sevens in the NFL. I believe they're behind uh, the San Francisco 49ers uh, as far as pressures and, and sacks are concerned. Jalen Carter, I think, leads the team. Uh, if not before the Jets game, I know he had three and a half sacks. Now he missed that Jets game. So he's leading the charge up front, obviously, with Fletcher Cox and and – and the rest of those guys. And then the secondary, the secondary has had some issues. The secondaries have some issues when they play Minnesota. Um, you know, Kirk Cousins was able to spread the ball around and, and get the ball downfield, stretch the field out of them a little bit. The Washington, uh, Washington Commanders, almost <laughs> the rescue, the Commanders um, was able to, you know, spread the ball around and get the ball uh, downfield in the end zone. Um, you know, so I, I look at it in a sense for – this defense, they need to apply pressure somehow. So that means if it's blitzing, if it's getting pressure from the D-line, they need to find a way to get up on Tua and get his hands up, get their hands up to try to bat some of these balls down. Now, obviously, you know, when we talk Miami offense, we'll start with Tariq Hill. and then, But I think the guy that they need to keep an eye on is Waddle. Because we all know, you know, probably slay a follow Tariq Hill well, for Bradbury or, you know, for, yeah. So, I mean, we're talking, we're talking Waddle. We're talking, uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, the running back, obviously, Achen, um being out with 460 yards rushing. Uh, Mostert is, I mean, he's another one, 429 rushing. But I think he's more of a threat in the backfield and outside being catch, catching the ball as well. Uh, so I think this is a this is a battle between two strong teams uh, from a offense and defensive standpoint, and then more from Miami from an offensive standpoint. But they're going to need their defense to try to create turnovers to keep them in this game. One thing I would say uh, when you said Slay will follow will will shadow Tyreek Hill, it's a bad idea to cover Tyreek Hill man to man. No, no, no. I no. It's I, I guarantee you. It won't be mad. It, it may have some type of zone, maybe some some cover three. Uh, they may do a little bit of bracket coverage uh, to force them to go to number two and number three. I think that's what you'll see. But, you know, I don't think that Slay will play man 
more than 20% of the time with him. Uh, but I think he will play a little bit of man, but it'll be a lot of zone. Oh, uh, I, I am, I am, I cannot number the times where I've seen Tyreek Hill and you're, you're absolutely a hundred percent, you know, some, you can't, you can't not be man sometimes. Right. But the, the Dolphins have this innate ability that that sometime we're going to make you pay for some time. Oh, yeah. um, you cover, you know, the cheetah once, man, Tua Tonga Vailoa will recognize that once. And that is going to be a bad moment for you, typically. Um, how many times have we seen it this year? It's like teams trying to take him out. And they, they they one time, two times, they cover a man, and there you go down the field, and there's Tyreek Hill scoring a touchdown and doing a backflip <laughs> selfie, and it's like, dude, <laughs> don't do that ever, ever. The oddly enough, the guy that is having a really bad year, Bill Belichick, he is the only one that basically was able to solve Tyreek Hill, and he yes. was able. Right? Yes. So Tyreek Hill had 40 yards against the Patriots in a Patriots loss, by the way, but the at least they contained Tyreek Hill. I would also say in that game, Jalen Waddle didn't play. It's a it's a bad choice either way, but if I had to choose, I'm not gonna let Tyreek Hill beat me. Jalen Waddle, you penguin yourself all day if you want. <laughs> Go ahead, prove it to me. Well, the thing the thing that Bill Belichick does that not a lot of NFL teams have done consistently or do on a an every game basis, obviously it changes who you play. Usually he'll put his number one corner on the number two receiver and he'll he'll bracket the number one, which will force you now to either go to three or four, or if two wins versus his top defensive back. Then, then now he starts to change it up. Bill Belichick is a defensive mind. We all know that. He knows about pressure and coverage. But that's what he used to do with uh, with Jackson. That's what he used to do with Revis. Um, and so that was kind of his scheme to force you to have to go either with number two of two wins or go to three and four. But let's, let's continue to stay on this course of how the game has kind of changed a little bit. Because Tom Brady made a few comments, which a lot of us alums – feel that same way a little bit of how this game has changed from how we play. And a lot of these younger guys take it as if we're dinosaurs that are, you know, the old men on the lawn talking about how the game has changed and the money and things of that nature. Well, Tom, Tom took on and made some interesting comments basically about how the game has gotten softer. Yeah. I can agree with what Tom is saying, but then also pull back and say, Tom, they made a rule with your name on it. Like, and I didn't get that call. Like the top, the Brady rule, if you hit a quarterback below the below the waist, a little bit more than knees, uh, obviously it's a penalty. Now that was due to Tom uh getting hit versus Kansas City, I believe, at that particular time, uh, which took him out for the rest of the season where uh he tore his ACL. Uh and I think Matt Castle came in to finish the season. And then they implemented a rule of the Brady rule, which changed. Now it seems like if you even push, sneeze, fall on a quarterback, it's a penalty. Uh, And me being a former quarterback, listen, I get it. You're trying to protect the players. But some of these these calls are getting way outrageous and out of hand from a, a defensive standpoint. For a sack, if you fall on them, you brought your weight down on them. Uh, if a guy catches the ball, defenseless receiver. Listen, I, a lot of these calls they make the defense hard because you don't know how to hit guys. Now, what are your what are your thoughts, Armando? Yeah, so uh, I'm right there on the lawn with you with the old guys. <laughs> uh, I'm the guy handing out cigars, Cuban cigars, <laughs> to you guys. Uh, I I get it, but it's a losing argument, and yeah. uh, we're just it. We are. We're, yeah. we're we're dinosaurs. Look, I I'm a Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> look at me. I'm a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Uh, look, I was at the NFL meetings this week. Right. And they said flat out, 
we are going to take the head out of the NFL. And what they meant by that is any tackle that is made with leading with the head, the helmet. The crown, the crown of the helmet. He said the head. I mean, so eventually the whole thing is going to be outlawed by the NFL. They don't want it in the game anymore. And that is one of the things where defenders have used that for a very long time as a weapon, and they don't want that anymore. And it's not just quarterbacks where you can't hit them in the head. You can't right. hit them below the knees. You also cannot hit them and then let your weight, you know, be on them. So right. you have to defy, defy gravity somehow as well uh, to protect the quarterbacks. And that's what they're doing. They're going to protect the quarterbacks. They're protecting receivers as defenseless runners down the field. And as a result, scores are up. Does the NFL want scores to be up? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right? Exactly. Because exactly. who loves that, Donovan? Who loves scores being up? Oh, well, the fans love it. And the people that's, pay the people that's paying and sponsoring the NFL. And that leads to money, yeah. money, the NFL, money. And the NFL loves money, and it's going to continue to happen. And then there's the the logic of what they're doing. This week, we're going to watch the Chicago Bears play against the Las Vegas uh, Raiders. Right. And uh, I do believe that Justin Fields is out. Yes, so, with the dislocated so, thumb. Right, so we're gonna get some dude named Tyson Badgent uh, playing for the Chicago Bears at quarterback, and Jimmy G is out. So we're gonna get either Brian Hoyer or Aiden O'Connell. I think it'd be NFL... O'Connell. Okay, O'Connell's good. good in this offense. I, I don't care if it's O'Connell or O'Connell's dad. The NFL doesn't want Aiden O'Connell uh, quarterbacking the 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 freaking Las Vegas Raiders when Jimmy G is on the roster and they definitely don't want Tyson Badgett quarterbacking the Chicago Bears when Justin Fields is on the roster they want to protect the quarterback so the quarterbacks right. who are the big name the big draw play every week Anthony Richardson is almost all also out for the season out for the season that's their argument against I'm sorry Tom uh, we're going to protect the quarterbacks because we want our signature players to play. Yeah, but going with that Anthony Richardson deal, that was that was him falling on his shoulder. Uh, and Anthony Richardson, being a former quarterback, I would love to talk to Anthony Richardson of how to protect himself outside the pocket. He's got to learn to slide. Now, Anthony Richardson is not small by any means. I believe he's about 6'3", 6'4", maybe 6'5", 200 and close to 230, I believe. Uh, so a lot of his injuries were almost self-inflicted. Like it was falling in the end zone and hitting his head on the ground after scoring a touchdown that led to a concussion. Then, then another uh, injury where he had a concussion, but then he got out of concussion protocol. So the shoulder injury is when he's getting hit, he's going down and now falling on the shoulder uh, instead of seeing the hit and trying to get under it or slide or whatever, protect yourself a little bit. So these are things that he will have to learn going forward. Um, and being out for the season, he'll get a chance to sit on the sideline and see it and communicate and get himself back healthy and all. But I just think the NFL in this regard is, is yes, they are getting soft. They've taken, they've taken the kickoff return out of the game where they've moved the kickoff up, I think, 10 yards. How they're changing the momentum of the game due to, uh, you know, a holding call, a chop block, whatever it may be. So I just think at this particular point, yes, you're right. Nothing's going to change from the NFL. You can argue. You can be upset with it. Uh, they're going to find ways to try to protect the NFL or oh. the players in the shield. By the way, you said nothing's going to change. I would say to you it's going to go further. Well, further I mean, down. nothing's going to change for, to go back. Meaning it's right. not going to go back. They're going to move Absolutely. forward where, you know, for a lot of the older guys, we're going to look at it like it's almost 707 uh, out there because you can't touch anybody or, or whatever it may end up being. You know, it's going to be pretty bad. You mean like flag football? 
flag football. Good thing you brought that up because that's going to become a, an Olympic sport. Moving on to our next topic. and See that transition? Good job. We Look, Armando, we've been working well together over these weeks. And I tell you, we're, we're flowing right now. So let's let's give to your top three draft picks if this happened to go with NFL players for the Olympics. Who would you take in your top three? So I, I don't – flag football basically eliminates size. It's like – Yes. Not important anymore. Right. It's all about speed and uh, agility and, you know, breaking ankles and all that stuff. Okay, I'll go with Tyreek Hill. That's my number one draft pick. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Tyreek Hill being number one. Who's your number two? Well, I just can't see some dude from Lithuania chasing Tyreek Hill <laughs> in the Olympics. He's like, excuse me, son. <laughs> you know? No, no. No, can you imagine some dude from Spain going, Oye, perate. No. No. <laughs> It's not so, okay, Get, who are you, who are your next three? I mean, who are your next two? Uh, oh, oh, wow, I didn't prepare for this. Let me see. Uh, maybe Wandale, somebody or other, Robinson. Some dude. I want small dudes. I want small, fast dudes. What okay. do you think? So I'm looking first, obviously, being maybe I'm biased or whatever, but Patrick Mahomes is, is my number one pick because you okay. need a quarterback that can kind of freelance – uh, and kind of throw the ball in different spots and windows because that's what seven on seven flag football, sort of speak, is at this particular point. Um, obviously, Tariq Hill uh, being my second pick, uh, and then my third pick, I, I think I'm going to go with a bigger receiver, a bigger receiver, not being so much taller, but a little taller than Tariq. So I'm going Justin Jefferson for my top mm-hmm. three picks. So at least at this particular point, I've got my quarterback. And I have my two wideouts. And then from that point on, my next two picks will probably be defensive backs. Um, and so with the defensive backs at this particular point, I mean, you know, Diggs is out. He's he's injured. Um, you know, and then from that point on, probably a maybe Sertain, Patrick Sertain Jr., uh, to, to utilize his ability to possibly play man at times. Uh, and then from that second second quarter, I mean, it could be it could be Gilmore, um, you know, it it could be Slay Darius Slay, um, you know, or a, a healthier Patrick Ramsey to be physical would be another one that you can utilize him at corner and safety. So this is obviously we're just having fun here. Just because, having fun. Yeah, this is a 2028 Olympics. This isn't happening next year, so. A lot of these guys will be out of the league by then. Yeah, yeah. But here's the problem with this conversation and with the, the topic for the NFL, Devon, um, Donovan. Um, did I just call you Devontae? I don't know. Yeah, you almost um, called me Devontae. I, I, I want to get you I want to I, I want to get you targets, bro. I still want to <laughs> get you targets against what's his name? Uh, <laughs> uh, look. The NFL, the, those Olympics will be one week out from the start of training camp. Right. And I would hate to be an NFL team who had a player in the flag football Olympics a, a week ago, and he, you know, blew out his knee <laughs> in the flag football Olympics. You, so- you could have said hamstring. You had to go straight to the knee. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, the the. I, I mean, you see non-contact injuries all the time. True. Playing true. football, true. including flag football. Right. That is why the NFL still has not fully embraced the thing because it has to get with the NFL PA, decide yeah. how we're gonna do this. Uh, what is it gonna mean for contracts? Is it gonna like non-football injuries? Are you going to like is team gonna cut somebody who is in the Olympics? for the United States or some other country. Right. And, you know, it's a non-football injury. You didn't have it in our facility or on our practice field. So right. all those things have to be figured out. But, man, it's going to be fun. And all, also, by the way, we better win. I uh, know that's right. That That's when it comes down to we definitely better win. I think 
they'll probably go with more of the former players, guys who have just kind of gotten out of the league and trying to work themselves back in. It'll be one they'll probably have tryouts for that. But that's going to conclude our show. Uh, very explosive show today. Make sure you tune in here at the Five Spot. We're streaming live. You can catch us on YouTube. You can catch us on a lot of different different avenues. But more importantly, tune in, tune in on Tuesday because we're going to recap the games from this this weekend. We'll talk a little bit of college. We'll talk about the Monday night game that happens. Uh, so make sure you wait, you tune in and watch Armando and myself here at the five spot. And let me just end by this. Congratulations to the Las Vegas Aces. Armando was all tuned in watching Asia Wilson uh, and Becky Hammond win their back-to-back championships. <laughs> well, Mark Davis, owner of the Las Vegas Aces, <laughs> finally brings home a championship with the ladies. Congratulations, ladies, and tune in back here at the five spot.